After retiring early at 44, I made some purchases which seemed a really good idea at the time, but on reflection they were a big mistake. In this video I'll share 7 purchases which were my biggest regrets. When we retire, especially early, it's tempting to indulge in spending on things that we've long dreamed of, but sometimes these purchases can turn into financial pitfalls. Let's dive into the 7 purchases that I regret the most. And in hindsight, I wish I hadn't made them at all. First up is my biggest early retirement weakness, cars. I thought that changing cars regularly would add excitement to my life. I was wrong. I was so hooked that at one point I had three cars just for my own personal use. I had a large SUV for transporting the family. I had a little mini hatchback as a daily driver. And I had a sports car for weekends. And I justified to myself the reasons for owning them all. That wasn't the only problem. I got bored with them really quickly. And that meant that I started to change them regularly, sometimes every six months. I got through nine cars in four years. In the first four years of my retirement, no car lasted more than two years. And some of them were traded in with only two or three thousand miles on the clock. Not just that, nine cars comes with a lot of admin. I had a filing drawer full of paperwork, bills, insurance certificates, you name it, it was in there. There was a lot of admin to do with nine cars, I can tell you. I was 50 years of age before I realised that this was madness and that these depreciating assets weren't worth the time and effort. They were more of a burden than they were a benefit. Now I keep a car for three to five years. I currently only have one, a modest five-door EV. I have to admit, I'm not still fully cured though. The other day I was looking online at 20-year-old sports cars, which I thought might be a good thing to have this summer to drive to the coast on a weekend. Once a caraholic, always a caraholic, eh? My second big purchase regret is designer clothes. It's my second former big weakness. I've always been image and fashion conscious. I put it down to being a baby boomer, born in 1961, when the 80s and the Gordon Gecko era were all the rage. Do you remember that one? Wall Street, greed is good, lunch is for wimps. I worked at a company just like that. It was all designer suits, Rolex watches and German cars. I was young and impressionable. I know that's not an excuse but it's the only one I'm giving. Now don't get me wrong, retiring doesn't mean you have to stop taking an interest in your appearance. I still do. The big difference is that I now only have a small number of high quality items that I can mix and match and they only take up half a wardrobe. My wife's clothes take up at least another two and a half. Splurging on high-end fashion brands like Gucci or Louis Vuitton or Prada often means you're paying for something that doesn't offer much beyond the label and they quickly go out of fashion. Before the advent of online second-hand marketplaces like eBay, I would donate most of my used clothes to charity and some of them I'd only had for a year. Now I've got a minimalist attitude to such things. Less is more, just more quality items but less of them and a good range of rock and pop t-shirts, obviously. My third thing is holiday homes or a second property. If you live in the UK, like me, and I live in Northern England where the weather isn't brilliant, a place in the sun is really appealing. At least that's what I thought. So on retiring early, I bought a small apartment on the Algarve in Portugal. But as a family, we only spent six to eight weeks at most there every year. And we didn't rent it out. We were far too precious about it for that. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed every minute of that time. It's a lovely place. The weather's fantastic, the food is fantastic, and the people are very friendly. But the reality was endless bills, bureaucracy, management fees, maintenance fees, just lots of admin, another drawer in my filing cabinet. All of which can be really overwhelming when you live 2,000 miles away and you're leaving the management of your property to someone else. Not just that, it places a limit on your travel experiences. Those six to eight weeks took away a bit of the flexibility, which was the whole point of retiring in the first place. I sold it after five years of headaches and replaced it with something else, which I thought was going to be a good compromise. And that brings me on to my fourth thing, timeshares. You would have thought I'd learnt my lessons about overseas properties, but I hadn't. Rather than owning a property outright, I thought it was a good idea to have several weeks in the same location, but without the headaches of ownership. Again, I was wrong. Timeshares might seem like a good compromise, but they come with a whole set of unique problems. The biggest one is that you can't resell them. 
And in the case of the ones that I owned, you couldn't rent them out either. You are stuck with them unless you practically give them away. Having said that, I have still got two weeks, a week in Scotland in March and a week in Portugal in December. And I wouldn't swap those two weeks for anything. I really enjoy going there at that time of year, but two weeks is enough. So my advice is tread very carefully if you're thinking of buying a timeshare. My fifth thing is hobby equipment. A couple of years ago, my wife and I decided to downsize and leave our large house in the country. And my garage was absolutely packed to the rafters with unused hobby equipment. We're talking four sets of golf clubs. Well, you've got to keep buying the latest driver and putter, haven't you? Two bicycles that never got used. The remnants of some of the hobbies that I took up in early retirement. One of them was a racing road bike and the other one was an off-road bike. I think I used them three times each something like that. The hobbies I took up in early retirement don't align with my current lifestyle now that I'm 63. So when we downsized, I sold, donated or dumped 75% of my stuff. I'll talk about that in a future video. My hobbies now are ones that need little or no equipment. My favourite is walking or hiking in the countryside. I only need a pair of walking shoes, a couple of walking poles and a backpack. That's it. My other hobby is strength training. I love going to a small local gym, which costs 30 pounds a month. And all I need is a pair of shorts, some simple trainers, and of course, a decent set of rock and pop t-shirts. No country club memberships for me. My sixth thing is another one of my weaknesses, electronic equipment. High tech gadgets can be very tempting. The marketing is very alluring, especially when they sell all the benefits and features of the latest upgrades. Who doesn't want an iPhone 15 Pro Max? Well, me actually. I've got an iPhone 11 and I've had it quite a few years now. I shoot all these videos on it. It does the job absolutely fine and I've got no intention of replacing it until it breaks down or Apple don't support it anymore. Or more likely, the battery won't hold its charge, which is what I found with my other iPhones. Once upon a time, I was seduced by Apple. I changed my iPhone, my iPad and my MacBook every time they brought out a new one. Not anymore. I'm happy with this old iPhone 11. I'm happy with my three-year-old iPad. I'm happy with my four-year-old MacBook. And I'm happy with my 10-year-old Apple Thunderbolt display. And my favourite gadget of all is my 2017 Sony 65-inch 4K TV, which is going just fine even though it's seven years old. There is no reason to replace it with the latest thing. I've no plans to replace any of those gadgets unless they break. I found that it's wiser to choose electronics that provide value rather than the latest trend. And finally, I come to my seventh thing, bigger homes. Why do people stay in their larger homes when the kids have gone? Bigger spaces mean increased maintenance, higher utility bills, higher maintenance costs. If there are just two of you living there, like me and my wife, or you're living solo, why do you need such a big property? What's the point of a 4,000 square foot, five bedrooms, three reception rooms, three bathrooms, an acre of land? That's the place where I was a couple of years ago. So me and my wife, we decided to downsize and move into the city to a 2,000 square foot, three bedrooms, two reception rooms, two bathrooms, and a single garage with a small courtyard garden. And it was the best decision that we made. It's smaller, it costs less to run, the utility bills are a lot less. And not just that, the biggest bonus of the lot is that it's more convenient for absolutely everything. Shops, restaurants, cafe, doctor, and the train station is a 15 minute walk and we can be on a train to London. In two hours, we'll be in the city center of London. So I've reached the conclusion that as we age, convenience and manageability become crucial. Downsizing can enhance your quality of life. It has mine. I walk more. I get outdoors more, even though I don't live in the countryside anymore. And as I said before, travel is just so much more convenient when a main line railway station is on your doorstep rather than a five mile drive on country lanes. Reflecting on these purchases has taught me a lot of lessons. It's taught me what truly adds value when you're in retirement. It's not about having more. It's about having what enhances your life without burdening your peace of mind. You should watch this video next. Seven things to stop doing if you don't want to screw up your retirement.